Okay, welcome to Home Assistant Part 3. This is a walkthrough. We're going to talk about security cameras. I'd like to say this is sponsored by Reolink. They sent me out the 410 series PoE and Wi-Fi camera. And I'm very excited to set those up in this video as a part of a demo of how we're going to set up RTSP cameras. If stuff like PoE or RTSP or ONVIF or any of that terminology doesn't make sense to you, I've got great news. The video right before this I just released is a basically a primer, and I'll link to that in the description below. But it'll tell you what these technologies and these acronyms are that I'll talk about throughout this video. If you do know what those are and you're trying to get your cameras hooked up, then let's get started. The goal of this episode is to get to this point right here. And at this point, we've actually done quite a bit, but it doesn't look like much yet. In future videos, when we get through automations and stuff, we'll be able to do more interesting things. But for here, what we're going to try to do is get our camera to be visible in Lovelace. Now, if you watched my other videos, you know Lovelace is the UI, and you see here I've got my backyard camera video. But more importantly, I've got the entity below it, which is the motion detection for that video camera that's actually being represented. What this means is we can do some really interesting things later, like to start recording on motion and so on. There's five main approaches I've come up with for how to get cameras to work in Home Assistant, and it's kind of based on what your camera supports. ONVIF integration is, of course, anything that supports ONVIF Profile S, which was ratified in 2011. The more of the Profile S that your camera supports, the better this integration will work for you. The real link will actually show this as one of the two different integration types that, as walkthroughs. But ONVIF is very, very easy to do. That's the big bonus, but you really need to have that support to have everything work. The camera integration is a little bit harder, but it's actually very generic and supports all sorts of things from RTSP cameras to MJPEG and all of the standard cameras that are basically what I call non-proprietary or standards-based cameras. The camera integration will get you there, allow you to do streaming and so on. The next one down is for those proprietary cameras, such as Arlo or Ring, and these are built-in platform-specific ones, such as an Arlo integration or Ring integration. Now these integrations that are built in have varying levels of support. And for instance, I don't believe the Arlo integration at time of filming actually supports the live video stream. The next one down is third party specific. This is where somebody, typically a, a amazing programmer and part of the community has gone and written a, their own integration that you can bring in a home assistant. Arlo with an extra A is a great example of this where the third party integration is better than the existing one. There's also a real link third party integration that gives you some extra capabilities. The benefit of these, of course, is that they're going to give you those extra capabilities. The downside is that they might be a little bit buggier. It's going to be based on how good or the integration has been done and maintained by the uh, third party developer. Finally, the other way to get a camera integrated in Home Assistant is to actually not integrate the camera with Home Assistant, but integrate the NVR system. So you take your network video recorder, you integrate that with Home Assistant, and then you integrate your cameras with the NVR. The benefit here is a lot of NVRs have amazing compatibility with a wide variety of cameras and technologies. Some of them have their own built-in motion recording or AI and so on, such as Blue Iris. And so if you can integrate the NVR with Home Assistant, you can save yourself a lot of trouble. Agent DVR is one I use as a demo here, and it actually integrates with YOLO, which I talked about in my last video as being an artificial intelligence to do object detection onto your video. So this becomes a very powerful way to get these in. We won't talk about this because it's probably worth its own video, but I do want to mention it as a fifth way of getting these cameras in so that you understand that. Okay, so before we get started, as typical of this series, I talk about the basically the terminology so you understand what we're getting into and what integrations are involved. The camera integration is what controls the camera. This is what turns it on and off. Now the camera integration relies on the stream integration to actually show the video. The stream integration only supports H.264. That means that if you're gonna to try to use the camera and stream integrations for Home Assistant and you wanna do this directly, you cannot use a 4K camera. Most of those are gonna use H.265 encoding. Again, my last video talks about encoding and why this is important. Now the stream integration is what allows you to record the streams, but it also allows to display them in Lovelace. So you're gonna want this so we can show the stream. This relies on yet another integration called FFmpeg. FFmpeg integration is what allows all the processing of the video. The other integration I wanna mention briefly is Camera Proxy. Camera Proxy is an integration that will allow you to downsample a camera. So if you have a 1080p video stream and you wanna show it in the UI as a 480p, 
which makes a lot of sense because if you're going to show like nine or ten cameras, you don't need to show them all at full res. You want to try to use the least uh, processor intensive way possible or at least network intensive way. So you can use a camera proxy to come up with a lower size. I wasn't aware of this until doing some research, so I decided to mention it as something to be aware of. Here's some camera platforms. Now the camera integration supports different platforms. Generic is gonna be your RTSP platform. This is gonna probably be your most common if you have a nice open source style camera that supports standards. MJPEG is the other really popular one. FFmpeg, you can actually use FFmpeg in a number of ways. In this version, you can actually use it as a camera platform, which means any video stream FFmpeg supports, you can pull in as a camera. That means things off the internet, that means local video files or whatever. MQTT, there's MQTT image servers out there. You can use that as a camera. Raspberry Pi, of course. And then the Yeeho, Mamcrest, and so on. These are actually brands of cameras or, or uh, brands that make a number of security devices. And if you pull in these platforms, you'll get better support. For instance, some of these will actually do triggers on not only motion, but sound. And so you can get that kind of functionality in Home Assistant by doing those specific camera platform integrations. Like anything with Home Assistant, you want to do investigations to find out what integration is going to be best for your camera. But being aware of what the different integration types are from OnVIF to this will really help you out. Okay, so what are the steps once we know all this stuff? How do we get a camera set up? Well, it was kind of an interesting process because it wasn't how you do most other things in Home Assistant. For cameras, you actually set them up outside of Home Assistant using the existing software that the camera supports. So you're gonna to wanna to set up things like your, your username, your password, and so on. Now remember, on security cameras, this all gets stored on the camera and it controls the camera. So if you set the bit rate for what you wanna record at using their software, that will stay on the camera and Home Assistant will pull in that bit rate. Home Assistant's really great at viewing cameras and doing automations based on motion and doing stuff like that or recording cameras, but it's really not great at managing cameras. MVR software might be, but Home Assistant is not. So using the existing software to get things configured is really important. The next thing we have to do is for network or IP based cameras, we have to get the IP address of the camera or get the OnVIF info if it's available. Then finally, we just add that in the Home Assistant. So really it's three steps. It's very simple. Let's get to it. Okay, we're gonna spend a minute to just set up the Reolink camera. The first thing you do is start the app and go over to the QR scanning. And on the bottom of the camera is a QR code. There's a PoE cable, that's the ethernet cable that's giving me power and network. And then there's a reset button if you need to reset the camera. There I've scanned the code, and since I've already set up this camera, I didn't have to do the basically the admin and password stuff. We can just move right into editing the camera settings. Now there's two types of streams that come off of each of the real link cameras. One's called clear, one's fluent. The clear is your higher quality stream, and you can see all the settings here. We can set resolutions, we can set frame rates, and we can set the bit rate of what's coming over. The higher bit rate's gonna be qual higher quality, but it's gonna take up a bit more network congestion. For the Fluent, this is kind of your preview stream. This is your lower quality stream that you can use for lower processing devices, and you can configure that separately. Both will come off the camera. I wanna take a quick look to show you some of the other features of the Reolink camera. It's got email uploading on motion, which is really nice. The motion detection is built into the camera, but it is pixel based. It also has FTP upload on motion, which is really nice, and of course, audio recording. Finally, the last thing we want to do is configure any of the UI settings on the camera itself for things like the name of the camera. We can set up this name to be front yard camera, backyard camera, whatever. This will get overlaid onto the camera UI and sent over to Home Assistant automatically as part of the stream. Last thing we do is get the IP address. Okay, let's do a demo of the real link software. The reason this is important is keep in mind your software for your camera that it either comes with or the NVR you add it to, that's really gonna be how you configure your camera change your settings, and actually do things like motion alerts, unless you do something more advanced. Now, right now we can see that I've got two cameras set up here. I can do a different grid if I had more cameras, if I want to do something more advanced. The other thing we can do here is we can change the settings per camera. So I can just say on this camera here, I want to change settings and I want to change the motion detection sensitivity. There's four different time periods I can give it, and I can set sensitivity for each of those. That's very powerful. I can also set the grid of where I care about motion. So this will actually load up an image. And I can see that, you know, maybe this tree has been really annoying. I can delete that tree out so I don't care about it blowing in the wind. 
Now you're gonna see here in a second, I really don't want motion down here to be activated. Well, we'll add that staircase in, but this right here has a piece that blows in the wind. Here is the camera. And if I go to playback settings, you can see all of these blue lines are the motion alerts. And if I hit play, then it's going to play back at that time period. Now, if I had four cameras, I would see motion alerts for each of them and I could see where the motion was and I can watch them in simultaneously, which is really cool. Now this one here that I'm playing back, the wind's blowing and this piece here ends up moving and that's what sets it off. Again, this is pixel based motion detection. So all you have is really a threshold. There it goes. So that movement there, that set off the camera. Let's talk about a couple other cool things about this. Not only can you do the motion detection settings, you also get this nice view of the calendar of when motion was detected on each day. Uh, we've been really windy here and I don't have it dialed in, so I have quite a bit of that. We can also do things like our networking uh, here. You can go to advanced. Now, one of the things you're going to want to know with yours is find out where your port is for your OnVIF if you have it. In this case, it's an 8000, which is a non-standard port for OnVIF, but super handy to know later. We're going to talk about that. Your RTSP port should be 554 if it's standard. If not, make a note of that. And then finally, your device settings, you should be able to go to something and get your IP address. You're going to need to know that still. Okay, now uh, we should know all of the data. Let's see what our data list is. We need a username, a password, an RTSP URL. Okay, how do we get this last half here? Well, this will come with your camera in the documentation possibly. There is also a home assistant forum post that might have this. Finally, the other way of getting it is using a tool called OnVIF Device Manager, which is this tool right here. You can use this tool. This will scan and look for your cameras. If it finds them, it'll list them here. Click on live video. You'll actually be able to view your camera. Now, this is a very useful tool for kind of digging in to what your camera supports via OnVIF and what standards it supports really well. But the best part is down here is your full RTSP stream, and that is super handy for Home Assistant. Okay, so I made a note that the OnVIF port's on 8000. I've got my full RTSP stream with my username and password. We have all the information we need to move on forward to Home Assistant. Okay, we're going to get started here with getting us into the UI. You can see we have a blank tab that we've created here, or a blank view, I should say. Here's the information we're gathering. Now, we're going to do two different methods. First, we'll do the OnVIF method, and this is all we need. We need the admin username, the password, the IP address, and the port. To do this one, we're going to go down the configuration. We're going to click on integrations, click the plus sign in the lower right, type in OnVIF. Now, even if you have an OnVIF camera, each time you add a camera, you're going to add this again. We're going to submit it, and we're going to get this IP address here and get ready to put that into this host name. Remember, the port is 8000 for the real link cameras, and I'm going to call this front yard because that's where this camera is going to end up being. I'm going to hit submit, and now it's going to want the auth for the camera. Once you do that, it's able to communicate with the camera over the OnVIF uh, forums protocols and actually get a bunch of information. Now we're going to set this for front yard. You can see it was very fast. That was all real time. There it is, this front yard camera. And now we're going to add it to the UI. So we'll go up to overview and we're gonna add it into here. Now, edit dashboard, we'll click on the plus and we'll go by entity and search for front. It should show up because I just added it there. There's front yard camera. I'm gonna click on that and say continue. Now, the cool thing about add by entity is it'll actually suggest a card for you and you can decide to pick a different one or just say you wanna add it. Now, I really like this card. This is exactly the view I wanna get. So I'm gonna say add to Lovelace UI and there we go. Then we'll edit the card now that we have it and we'll make it look a little bit prettier. You can see it has this profile mainstream. That's not exactly what I want. I just want to say front yard. So I'll type that in there. Uh, oh, sorry, right here, name. <laughs> I'll leave that in just so you know. This is the, actually the entity name. We want to keep that, but we want to call it front yard. There it is there. Uh, you can give it a camera entity. I'm going to point it at that there and I don't need the state. That's not really super useful. This name here, this Joe's office is actually coming from the real link software. And that's why I was telling you that's important what you put there. And this date here and time is also coming from there. You can move that around. Okay. So if I hit save, there we go. We've got that ready to go. And there's our view. Now this will update every so often, but if I click on it, I can actually get the live view of the camera. Since this is mainstream, and I said that it was gonna be the full 5K, cause that's the POE resolution. 
So I had to pause to mute it real quick. I muted it here because the audio was coming through. But there is my camera. Okay, so what if you don't have a fancy OnViv camera and you have to actually get dirty into the configuration YAML? Let's talk about how to do that. Click on Supervisor, click on Add-on Store, make sure that you have one called File Editor installed. If not, go snag it, install it using the stuff that you learned from my last video. Once you have File Editor and you enable it in the sidebar, you can click on it over here. And this will basically give you a nice, easy editor to edit the configuration.yaml. Now, if you're more advanced, you can use Visual Studio Code. You can go to the Samba Share, you can use SSH and Nano. There's a ton of ways to slice this, but at the end of the day, you just want to edit this file. You also want to edit it very carefully. Um, I'll give you an example. So what I've done here is I've added this camera and I've got it all the way to the left. And if I add a space here, you look up here and the, it has an exclamation point. The reason I like the file editor is it shows you immediately, hey, something's wrong and your YAML is misformatted. Visual Studio Code does some great jobs at this also, but basically you want something to help you if you're not good at the YAML. We're going to add camera and then we're going to say platform generic for RTSP. If you have an MJPEG camera or if you want to use FFmpeg because you're comfortable with that, you can do that and just look at the documentation for how to fill this out. Now for the generic camera, for an RTSP camera, we're going to give it a name. This is going to be my front yard. I'm adding the word generic just to differentiate it from my other front yard uh, enter entry. And now we're going to have two things here, still image URL and stream source. The What I'm doing now is since I'm teaching you how to do this, I want to teach you how to do it right. These URLs are going to have the username and password passed into them, and I want you to be able to hide them. So what I'm doing here, and you'll see a lot of people doing this if you look at their YAML files, is I'm using the secrets file. Secrets file is very simple. You do exclamation point and the word secret, space, and then you just give it a name. That's it. We're going to go into another file and we'll add that name and the actual value in there. So make sure that you add these two, you make up two names here that you know that are separate, one for the still, one for the stream. And then what I did is I made a little cheat sheet. Here's my secret entries here. So I have the names and then I put the name, the colon, and then the value that I'm going to put into the secrets file. Now the video URL, it's an RTSP URL. It works a little bit differently. It's going to be the username, colon, password, at, and then the IP address and the ending of the stream that we talked about before for the RTSP stream. This is how we authenticate to RTSP in one line using what's called basic authentication. Now, one thing to note about this image, the still image URL, is I haven't shown you how to get that. I got this from the real link site. You can get this from a Home Assistant thread that I'll link if it's in there. Uh, if your camera's not listed, you're going to have to research it with the camera manufacturer, Reddit. Basically, you're going to have to find this URL because it's really handy and it's required for the picture entity card. We're going to want these, and what we're going to do now is we're going to go and edit the camera or the secrets.yaml. Here we go, secrets.yaml. Okay, so this is what I was telling you where it's the name, colon, and the value. You see, I've just got that passed up there. There's my admin colon password at. All right, green check mark, that means that's good. I'm gonna save that. We're gonna to go to configuration. Now we need to reboot the camera section to make this work. The way to do this, you go to configuration, you go down to server controls, and you can look for uh, reload generic cameras. There you go, you can click on that and that can reload the camera entries. If you have non-generic cameras, then you can restart here from the server. And then when you go to overview, you'll get something on the corner just saying that everything's being reloaded. Okay, so now let's add it. It's going to look very similar. The neat thing about these tutorials is you're going to start getting familiar with just how things work. So we're going to say by entity. We're going to say front yard generic. Remember, I give it that name there. I'm going to say continue. And here it comes. There it is. Add to Lovelace UI. Now this top one is the OnViv one. Oop. And this bottom one here, I can click on it. There you go. Okay, I want to talk about latency real quick, and I want to show you why I've talked so much about NVRs and the software that comes with your camera. Software that comes with your camera can render RTSP streams directly. So this right here is the real link software again, and there is the RTSP stream being rendered. These can, this is the Home Assistant streams. They're pulling in the RTSP streams, but they're actually translating it to something called HLS. HLS is an HTTP streaming me method. Now, if you're pulling in MJPEG cameras, this isn't true. MJPEG will not go through this. It will actually just show the image and 
browsers know how to do that, but browsers don't know how to show RTSP yet. So this is what this is all about. I'm going to hold my hand out and I'm going to start counting to show you the latency across each of these. So what I want you to do is look at all three of these images and notice how much faster the real link is going to show my hand show up versus the other two. And that will give you an idea of how much latency your home assistant will likely have if you're not using MJPEG. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there we go. It's actually about six seconds from what I understand. It's three segments of HL, from what I understand the HLS, it's three segments at two seconds each for six seconds of latency that you're gonna get down to and then you're kind of stuck at that unless you switch off of H.264 um, on an RTSP stream. That's just, that's just the nature of Home Assistant. Now, the one way of getting around this that I understand is if you get an NVR that can reserve the frames from RTSP to something else, or if you have a very beefy computer that can use FFmpeg to transcode it, things like that, there's you know a bit more technical than what I'll get into in this video, then that can happen. Now, that all being said, I have the micro SD card on the real link camera. And the reason I do that is so that when it records, it records locally. So the camera operates and records separately. Home Assistant just gives me a way to actually show me the camera, show me sensors and do things like automations when this happens. Now I'm going to show, talk to you about the motion sensor next. And the motion sensor does not have this latency issue because the motion sensor is a polling thing where we're going to pull a rest web service. So let's get into that next. Okay, this next section we're new kind of quick, but we're gonna add a motion sensor. Now there's two different ways I know of to add motion sensors. One is via the OnVIF integration. The OnVIF integration might have detected one on your camera if it's fully OnVIF certified. Remember that Profile S talks about things like motion off cameras. Here's a way to find out. Go to configuration, go to integrations here, click on OnVIF, click on your camera, and you should see how many devices and entities showed up. If you see the entities and you click on them, now I have one hidden entity, that's the substream, and then you've got the mainstream. This is all that my camera showed up. If you had a motion sensor, that should show up here. And if you had, uh, let's say, the CPU value or you know detection of sound, any other OnVIF type things that came in with your integration would have shown up there. I did not get it because the real link 410 for whatever reason doesn't send it up, but it does have what's called a REST API. Let's show you how to get that set up. I'm going to go to the file editor. I already talked to you about how to get this set up and we're going to add a binary sensor. Basically, we're going to add all of this text right here. The platform for this binary sensor, there's different platforms. We're going to say it's a REST platform and REST platform is a HTTP, basically like a website that is constantly serving back what's called JSON. If you don't understand what that is, it's kind of technical and something that would be tough to get into in a video. This is what comes back off the real link cameras. Now this API I got out of a forum, or I'm sorry, this link I got out of a forum that gives you back this JSON here. This state is zero if there's no motion. And I'm gonna see if I can kick it over to one. Yeah, so I waved my arm, I hit refresh, and immediately it went to one. It is faster than the latency on a camera. So it's super handy if you have something set up for your motion detection and know if motion's going on. We want this basically state value, which is a sub value of value here. So let's look at how this is templated out. There's a value template and you see it's gonna get the first element of value and then it's gonna go and get the state there. And that will determine one or zero if this is true or false. It's scanning every two seconds, which is plenty fine for my motion. I can lower that if I want. And then I've given it a name, in this case, um, Backyard Motion. Now this is for my backyard one. I'm gonna show you how to copy this in case you have multiple sensors. There's my green check mark. You see the dashes are lined up now. I've got a new platform for REST. Now this one right here is a different IP address. It's 140. I'm gonna say save. I'm gonna go with the full restart and say okay. We're back. Let's talk about how to get that card now. We're gonna go to the overview. We're in the editing mode. We're gonna click on the plus sign. This should look real familiar. We're gonna go by entity. And start typing in front yard to filter this out and you see there it is the binary sensor front yard motion that i made we're going to click on that and click continue now create a suggestion for me this one's actually really nice i'm going to say add that to lovelace ui and there it is 
Now it says clear. I'm going to wave my arm. Now keep in mind, the camera's going to be delayed by about seven seconds, but right when I wave my arm, there it is, detected. It took it about a second, maybe a second and a half, and then I stopped. <laughs> there's, there's the camera. So the nice thing is if we do a trigger on this and we actually trigger for recording of the motion or anything, we can make sure we actually capture uh, the person that would trigger the motion or the thing that would trigger the motion. At this point, you've got motion triggers and you've got your cameras in. In the next video, I'm going to talk about automations. One last thing I want to talk about is a binary sensor in Home Assistant. I kind of skipped over what that was. A binary sensor is simply a sensor that can be on or off or have one of two states. Now, the device class is what determines what those states are called. Because we said the device class was motion, then it shows up as either detected or clear. Clear meaning no motion. If I were to set the device class to something else like power, then it would change those words to be on or off, and it would actually change the icon that is defaulted there. I can also do something like door and have the door be open and closed and so on. So. When you do a binary sensor, the device class is what determines what words show up based on what's going on there. I want to thank you for watching this. I'm Joe Farrow with Geek Toolkit. Until next time, this is the wrap-up of Episode 3, Cameras. Let me know if you have any questions down below, and please take a look at the links that I put in the description because they will tell you a lot more technical details. They'll tell you how to help reduce latency and some other things that help you with getting your cameras up and running. Thanks a lot. Till then. Mm.